So, Rocky, the esteemed vulture television critic. Esteemed. The famous I don't person. know about all that. No, that's a lie, but sure. Nah, whatever. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm judgmental of vulture. Only like you and Jen, and then I hate on everybody else. <laughs> Everyone else is bad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to read. I don't have to read anybody else's stuff. I'm Jay. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm biased. You're like, can I get a subscription, but only for two bylines? Oh, it's part of Apple News Plus. I could just, I could just go to there that. Yeah, read the people I need to read, and be like, I don't care about everybody else. They're all wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They don't know nothing about rap music. They don't mm. watch black TV. Are you telling me that you didn't like Craig's interview with Killer Mike? Oh, let's just say I put Killer Mike on pause with his the a lot of his recent political views. I thought like, Craig's, Craig's interview was very good, and I thought that he uh, sort of backed Killer Mike into a corner where Killer Mike basically had to be like covering up for the fact that he didn't have answers. <laughs> I've, I've I've heard this, and people I have friends who shared it around. It's like, do I really want to like? He's kind of, he's kind of lost his way in the Biden era in terms of his uh, political points. But I just he got three thousand uh, on the song. He got hundred three thousand on the song for a verse. That's good. Hey, that's I that's mean, a miracle. That's a miracle. That's we something. Got that. That's a minute. Will that's... you? Uh, I guess I'll take that over his like every person should own five guns ideology. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, we're going to talk about. We're here I'm to talk Virgo. about something else. I'm mm-hmm. a Virgo. We're here to talk about I'm a Virgo. Mm-hmm. Jarrell Jerome, Harmon mm-hmm. Ajogo. I don't know if I'll ever mm-hmm. say her name correct. Mike I think Epps, that's right. Um, mm-hmm. And the rest of the people that I sadly don't know their name because I'm mm-hmm. bad. You also part. have you have Kara Young. Okay. Okay. Yes. You have Walton Goggins. We do, yes, we do have Walter Goggins who doesn't completely like Walter Goggins all the time. And mm-hmm. perplexing me. Mm-hmm. Walton, not Walter. Walter. Walton. 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 But yeah, so I think it's a pretty solid cast. I, I want to know before we even get talking, I'm going to derail this and I'm going to ask you how you felt about Sorry to Bother You. And after Sorry to Bother You, if you were like, whatever Boots makes, I will watch. Like, what was your Boots as a cinema TV creator relationship? And was it the same as your Boots and, like, hip-hop relationship? See, I'll be honest. I didn't have a big Boots, Riley, hip-hop relationship with the coup. Like, Mm -hmm. I that wasn't in my... My Bay Area listening is, like, E-40... Little Mac Dre, mm-hmm. um, too short. You know, we talking about that pimping and hustling. That's that's mm-hmm. gonna get played on my and nothing against it. I just literally, they were playing their videos on MTV or BET or even the box. At least not where I was. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a black movie, so I gave it a. You know, I'm saying oh, I'm gonna go see this. I like Lakeith. Uh, Omar Hardwick is in it. They had the mm-hmm. you know it's playing you like whole, Tessa. Out. Yes, yeah, huge crush on Tessa Thompson, and, mm-hmm. and it was playing off that joke off the you know the white voice. The black people mm-hmm. have to change their voice, and then you go see the movie, mm-hmm. and you're sitting there, and you're like, well, "This movie is really weird." And you got Stephen Yoon as a labor organizer. You have explorations about like art, you know, radical radical act activism with. Art Tessa and Thompson's characters and, and how it comes together and the, mm-hmm. the the want to not be broke leading you down these these perils of capitalism and then you get the the twist and the twist is where I laughed out loud and I can see other people like some of our critical peers looking confused and I was like oh this is how it got lit this is the best part mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. I think like I think the thing about sorry to bother you and we can talk about this as well in the context of I'm a Virgo is I like that he takes figurative things literally. Yes. Right? Like, I'm a Virgo is very much about the fear of, like, the large Black man 
which so often is like the description of crime, right? Mm -hmm. Like something bad happens to like a white person and the explanation is like large black man. I've watched enough Dateline where a husband will kill his wife or a wife will kill her husband. And the lie that they often make up to tell the police the is like, there was man. a large black man who intruded my home and killed my spouse and I couldn't do anything about it, right? So like, I'm a Virgo, takes that description, makes it literal and asks what happens after that. Um, and sorry to bother you, just something very similar, right? Where there is this like horrible, pervasive, created by slavery description of like how hard can black people work right mm -hmm. like are they genetically stronger than white people were they bred to be this way all this like awful like eugenics style shit that has pervaded in this country for hundreds of years um and again it, it becomes the text right it becomes these people are being turned in to the like little beasts of burden to like right. centaur, hearse, horse people, right, exactly. And they're gonna work harder and better for this corporation, right? So like, I have always admired the audacity of that, of like taking these colloquialisms and um, like social signifiers, like the horrible ways we talk about other people <laughs> and making them very specific. Uh, so from the very beginning, I was like intrigued by that idea. But so you would say like you liked Sorry to Bother yeah. You, like you, you ended in a place where you were curious about what he was going to do next. And then I want to know, like, I just, I want to know like <laughs> your journey with this show. Because it is a journey, right? Like it starts in one place and ends in another. So I'm curious about your reactions to that. I'm taking over your show, Julian. What? What I didn't. What I was surprised with is how it was a show that I shouldn't be surprised. I shouldn't have been surprised at like where it was going to go in terms of like the people versus like corporations. Mm -hmm. But it's like for the most part, you just thought of like, oh, there's this giant black kid. He's mm -hmm. kept away from the world. He's in the world. And they have to worry about like how that's going to um, work within the world. Like him protect him, not get killed. What I didn't expect was because it's a show that it low-key became the X-Men mm -hmm. in which I would say the way in which particularly black fandom talks about the X-Men and the nature of mutanity equaling uh, black personhood in America going off of that myth Stanley put out me and me and Jack we were we were watching Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and we patterned Professor X after Martin Luther King and we patterned Mal Magneto after Malcolm X it's like yeah, yeah, yeah we all know that's subterfuge and part of his carnival barkerism but some of that is literal mm -hmm. the literal um, I'm very critical of people when they say Batman is a bad guy and Batman is the feds, Batman is the police, because that means it 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 takes it takes Twitter language versus outside of what the text always said about Batman. But I also get sick and tired of always seeing evil Superman killing people, blowing people up. I was like, oh, you have an evil Batman in this, and mm -hmm. it ties in the whole superhero thing into the issues of where we at within late capitalism and society in the West right now. You know, why do we love these superheroes so much? What are the stories mm -hmm. they're telling with these superheroes? How are this affecting the way we look on society? And what does it say about the people who made some of these superheroes? And do they lose their way? Like, that's in there. Um, and the internal debates of between Black radicalism of generational divides on how do we attack this problem and mm -hmm. who's right and who's wrong and how, like, they both have, they both falter. But it's, it, I do like when you get to, yeah, people, I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about the show, so it'll be spoilery. Uh, 
that the younger generation some of the methodology is actually the correct way in attacking this problem that isn't just white and black at this point. It is, mm -hmm. it is class-based too. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I thought that was surprising to put all that in there and leave enough threads that like, if they get a season two, there's more to explore, especially with Cootie and fashion mm -hmm. and other things like, I was, I was surprised. I was literally surprised that they also like, like Amazon. It feels weird to have Amazon put out a show, in which, like, it completely. It does more than criticize Amazon, and mm -hmm. yeah. it, it says basically you're evil, which yeah. then puts it to this whole dynamic of, they're so powerful, or they don't care. Like you can say that they we don't care. Evil. And we're still going to put this out because it's going to benefit us in the end. Because it was like, mm -hmm. you no, know, what we like, we don't sell it. You still took voices. our money. Yeah. You still took our money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is also we're a very hip hop thing. To do. Yeah. 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 Like, we're not silencing your freedom of speech. We're giving you a platform to discuss these important issues. Like, yeah, you're talking about us, but like, if it wasn't us, it would be somebody else. Right. Apple so, isn't like, doing there's this. a lot of. Yeah. There's a lot of that sort of thing. Um, okay, I we're definitely going to talk spoilers. I wonder if we should give like a little bit of plot just to like remind people who are listening, or if you're listening and you haven't watched the show, and we're going to like encourage you to watch the show. But the general gist is we're sort of I believe we're in present day Oakland, right? Um, I guess so. Yes, yeah, alternate Oakland. Yeah, exactly. Like, sorry to bother you. It's sort of an alternate. Uh, a little bit more absurdist, like fantastical version of our reality. Uh, so in this Oakland, there is a 19-year-old young Black man named Cootie, who is played by Gerald Jerome. Uh, and he was raised by his aunt and his uncle, who are played by Carmen Ajogo and Mike Epps. And he's been raised in like secrecy, right? Mm -hmm. Like he was like a huge baby. <laughs> allegedly born to uh, Mike Epps' sister. Um, and his whole life, his parental figures have both been telling him, like, the world isn't ready for you. So, like, we can't take you outside. And you sort of maybe have a mission. We're preparing you for something, mm -hmm. right? Like, we need you to be smart. We need you to be strong. You have to study... You have to like lift weights. You can't watch a lot of TV. We're not going to let you eat fast food. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like almost hippie-ish homeschooling happening where it's like they're trying to set him up, I think, for the realities of this world. As you said, when we talked about it at another point, for the reality of people are going to see him and be scared of him. Mm -hmm. um and setting him up for the reality of like maybe he was born this way because he has a larger purpose mm -hmm. and they want him to be prepared for what that purpose is um and of course like any teenager he is rebellious he wants to eat fast food he wants to like hang out with other kids he watches reality tv and his version of the world is based on like the crap that people say in reality TV. Like he absorbs their talking points and reality TV often um, elevates people who are sort of sociopaths yep. and like really believe in themselves, have overconfidence. And he absorbs a little bit of that too. Uh, and he also reads a comic book called The Hero which is by and about this tech billionaire who's played by Walton Goggins. This is like the Batman figure that Julian mm -hmm. is talking about. Um, he is a billionaire from tech stuff. And he also very rigidly believes in law and order. So at night, this tech billionaire puts on this suit and he patrols Oakland and he arrests people, he attacks people, he is basically like a city-approved vigilante. So, 
Cootie is growing up idolizing this figure and thinking that he represents like the height of truth and morality. Um, and so amid all of that, one night, he sneaks out, right? I'm remembering yeah. this correctly. He gets spotted and then sort of gets like a little bit of a taste of the outside world, sneaks out. And then through sneaking out, he makes friends with a group of like also late teen, early 20 something people, one of whom is like a community organizer. Um, they are protesting evictions. And Cootie also strikes up like a flirtatious relationship with another young woman who works at this burger restaurant. And then I want to throw it to you because it's interesting to me that these two women, I don't know how the show identifies Jones. I don't know if they use she or they, um, but these two just other Jones. figures. I think they just okay, say Jones so these, all the time. Okay. So these other two figures that Cootie meets are also revealed to have superpowers. So there's like a superpower thing happening. There's like, to your point, an organized labor activism thing happening. There's the thing happening with the animated show within the show, which I'm yeah. really curious for your take on. And there's the stuff happening with the hero who gets almost his own like standalone episode. So you can understand like how this man who is a titan of industry believes that through his material success, of course, that means that he's also the right person to like be law enforcement, right? I think that's such a smart discussion of how people who are successful in capitalist structures also then believe that they would be successful in other like other realms, systemic other areas, yeah. like in other realms. Yeah. Like how much have we heard like the horrible theory that Mark Zuckerberg like wants an elected office <laughs> that like he wants to run for government? Like how much, you know, how often are incredibly rich people who donate to politicians just like gifted ambassadorships and diplomacy yeah it's, it's just to like, make you do things. like you know what yeah, to do you're, you're a businessman yeah your wealth gives you access so much of this show i think is about wealth gives you access access to the police access to the media access to people who have less than you because you can like draw them in by having more um so the show is doing like an insane amount of things in seven roughly half hour episodes. Um, and I would say that it asks more questions than it answers, I think. But I think that the answers that it gives about how to like move forward and what actions are needed are very much like Sorry to Bother You, which was so much about how you will find your individual power within the collective. Mm -hmm. And I think this show also does that. And so, yeah, so that, I guess, I guess, given my, like, you know, 10 minutes of talking interrupted, I want to know if, like, finding that individual power within the collective, like, if that's an X-Men thing, and if that feels to you like the show playing with mythology. So I think there's a lot I do think going on with with the nature of comics and cartoons in this show. Like, like, let's go back with the hero. Like, the hero, not only is it a play on the Batman, Tony Stark ideas mm -hmm. of the rich person going out into the world and protecting things, but also actually injecting some of the way rich people actually talk in real life in terms of just do the right thing, follow the law, the law is the right thing. And you'll law, be fine. The law is made mm -hmm. with, with, the, with the correct intentions. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can get here. It also plays with some of the nature of comic book creators of the, okay. of the past history of comic books, especially in the modern world. I would say 
there is remnants of Steve Ditko and his um, objectivist philosophy. Okay. And that's a lot of stuff that people don't know, like his uh, his views toward of like Spider-Man growing up, how like once you're an adult, you got to do, you can't have, you can't be certain things anymore, which was a kind of a part of the, one of the many things that divided him and Stan Lee in terms of where they wanted to go with the character along with other things. But then you get into characters like the question and we, the question isn't known much by now, but let's just say the most famous version of the question is Alan Moore's skewering of the question and objectivist ideas is Rorschach mm -hmm, in Watchmen, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. nobody caught was not, he may have been the the pro, the point of view character, but he wasn't actually someone to look up into being, which no one really got, except the people who made the TV show when they turned him into a symbol for white supremacy. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is always I I do always worry about myself when I'm like I kind of agree with a lot of what Rorschach says, and I'm like uh oh yeah 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 I think that's 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 what that I said, that's how Alan Moore is Jesus because it's like you make sense to you really double down and really think about how he's thinking and going about things. Um, mm -hmm. But also the, the character also reminds me of Todd McFarlane. Like okay. a lot of people don't remember, like in the, in the nineties, basically all the most popular artists of superhero comics were making boatloads of money working for the companies, but actually deserve more money mm -hmm. because Marvel was printing up, T-shirts and do this using the art and not giving any royalties on. They only got royalties on the comic books. They came together, left, told both companies that we're no longer working with you. Made Image Comics. Tom McFarlane mm -hmm. was one of the standouts because he made Spawn, which is was the first real super hit. And then remember, everywhere he, in the nineties, like as nineties, like kids and teens, like Spawn was. was there was everywhere. a Spawn movie. There was a Spawn show. He made I had his own a Spawn toys. Action figure. Yeah. Yes, I had one of the special toys. Spawn he, he was bought those huge. baseballs. You remember when he bought the, mm -hmm. the baseballs? Like that's how rich this man who drew comic books got. They would interview mm -hmm. him. Now here's like the thing is, I don't feel that this is an indictment on Tommy Farland, but that vision of seeing a person who draws comics get to that level of wealth, access, and power for essentially making a hero that's telling you as a young person this is the right thing to do. This is the correct, like seeing that as Walter Goggins is this white guy with brown hair. I was like, Oh, that's, that's 1995 Tom McFarlane. Like, wow. Like mm -hmm. you put this in here and how that effect of being like a black kid, um, reading comics, taking this mm -hmm. in and you meet. And the sad thing is as a black person in comics, and even as one that's maybe haven't had it as hard as other people recently, being, I guess you could say, liked or respected or, you know, respected on a creative level, they like me as a person. The stories I've heard of other people when they meet, when they meet these people as their hero, they created these stories that they kind of lived their life on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to hear how they're reacted to by these, these white people. That mm -hmm. reminds them is like to them, you just another nigga. And it's just like to see that in the screen, mm -hmm. it's just like that is a that is a subtle, real understanding of this world as a mm -hmm. fan of superheroes. Mm -hmm. And how sometimes you're not thought of, which is I think what ties it to the X-Men thing, because that myth about mutants being essentially black people for so long even though they're mostly all white all the famous x-men are white with the exception of storm a storm who um, they make like i don't want to say like yeah. very black but you sometimes know what I mean? they can sometimes, sometimes make them very black to white people but yeah. very not black to black people mm -hmm. but to get into this whole thing and then in a certain way they kind of like take the x-men away from black people and they mm -hmm. give it to like uh, the LGBTQIA community at times where mm -hmm. they focus it on that or they kind of make them like Native Americans. And not saying that that's bad because I'm always like, 
the group is supposed to represent a minority. And there are times in which when you're telling that story, it should kind of connect more with other minority experiences within this country. But to be the base of this thing for so long and to have it kind of just like, nah, this ain't for you. And to almost think like within the culture of black superhero fandom, I feel there's a a reclamation of it current with the current things of the X-Men, which I don't think will hit the mainstream until like they actually get to how they're going to adapt the X-Men into the MCU. Right. Um, Right. About there's this current thing is the X-Men, they made their own nation. They left the rest of the world to live on this nation. They interact within um, the world as this, you know, they have a rogue state. It's like they're they have power. No one else can really stop them. The only people that's kind of on the same level is Wakanda because of the nature. I was going to say, yeah, Wakanda is within the fandom and the pop culture. Mm-hmm. Narrative. But to see this and the, how the book started, that seemed like the person writing it, whose name is Jonathan Hickman, either had to be talking to or reading a lot of like black radical writing of like the seventies and eighties and nineties. In terms of like talking about interacting with the like black people would take it, like how would you make a society just for like us? And to mm-hmm. see that I think replicated and basically having Cootie is a giant black man with abilities that's different than everybody else. Mm-hmm. But then you have to see like, oh, um the woman he's interested in is Laura. This- Laura is essentially the Flash. Mm-hmm. Everything's slow for her. She has mm-hmm. to slow down. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jones is essentially Professor X in a new way. They said, mm-hmm. I'm not going to not say you didn't see me. I'm going to explain how these system works in a way that you can understand it. Uh, Jones's he, power is like persuasion, essentially. Yeah, the veil, right? The, some type of veil of explanation or something. Mm-hmm. But since she, she talks to people mind, like she gets them mm-hmm. all together and she talks to everyone. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you people get shrunken. Mm-hmm. And, and That's they, interesting because there's no explanation for it. Right? There's no explanation like, for yeah, it's like they just they just wake up in there and they're 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 shrink, they're shrunken people. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they think maybe it's like a curse. Or that, like, an enemy did this to them or something. They did it to them or something. Yeah. But it's not much different than... We all know about Flint having bad water now. And they still have bad mm-hmm. water. Mm-hmm. But sometimes what people seem to forget is that in Black communities, you know things are messed up for a mm-hmm. while. And it's talked about before it becomes, like, mainstream. Like, mm-hmm. yo, don't drink the water. Go get these filters. Go do this mm-hmm. at the third. Uh, pull these things in that you talk about as a community because you know and you don't expect the state and the government, mm-hmm. no matter if it's run by our own people or not to mm-hmm. actually do what's supposed to be done because we also know that the corporations got to make money, so that's the reason why it's like this to begin with. So to see that kind of explored not being explained at all because sometimes the things that happen in communities like, yo, how'd that happen? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm reading about this right now because I remember seeing this on the news. But like, uh, in West Baltimore, there have been like increasing, uh, increasing findings of E. coli in the drinking water, and it's like, what's Baltimore doing? Like, is Baltimore doing anything? Like, not really. Like, it was caused by the general like infrastructure failure. And yeah. yes, infrastructure failure is absolutely a nationwide problem in this country, 100%. It also happens to be at its worst in like low income communities, but also happen often to be rural communities, black communities, indigenous communities, like mm-hmm. that's where we are. So I think that's a good point. Like it could be one of, it could be a narrative stand in for that. Um, What I found really interesting from like the writing of this is that you and I can pull all of these like real life illusions. We can pull specific comic book illusions. But I also think 
it's all presented like a myth yeah. like a story that like doesn't really have an explanation things just happen and so from a narrative perspective like as the audience we just have to go for that ride right like you can't look for loopholes because that's not the purpose of this kind of story you're looking for what does this one action provoke in our characters what are their reactions to that how are they proactive about it what happens because of this potentially inexplicable thing so I appreciate that because I feel like right now we live sort of in like a culture where everybody is doing like gotcha you know it's like yeah. I found the flaw in your story I found the loophole I can't take it seriously and I think this show very actively like reject that you're not going to find an explanation you can explain it to yourself by pulling a lot of different references yeah what matters more than why was cootie bo born large is does he use his and we get different answers for that right like we get the we get cootie entering spaces again which you have said that are driven by black culture but controlled by white commerce mm -hmm. like the fashion he is like modeling these like urban inspired quote-unquote clothes in these scenes that play to horrible like prejudices like in yeah. one of them he is back slapping a female mannequin the creator of the fashion line is white the agent that right. has like signed cootie is white most of the people in the crowd at the mall are white so there is that sort of like we are going to use cootie's largeness to talk about greater social issues and inequities and we're going to lead to this climax where there are two options on the table and the options are an act of like one-off radical violence, which probably will make Cootie feel good and feel mm -hmm. like he's making a difference and feel like he is doing something flashy and big and it'll get attention and people will agree with it. Or you have like the longer term, more needing of collaboration and cooperation. And like we said before, persuasion act of a general strike so i i really i really appreciated that those were the two options because i think that there is validity in each as a political tool and i think the show does argue a little bit that there is validity in each as a political tool but i think it's so clearly and interestingly comes down on the side of build a new movement and a new ideology rather than just relying on like one-off acts and I just thought that was really interesting again like we don't really have like I don't want to say we don't have a pop culture understanding of labor because I think there have been some movies and tv shows that I love very much and that you and I have talked about a lot that discuss these issues. High Flying Bird being like, I think the best one in a very long time. Yeah. But I think as a culture, like for a long time, as unions lost power and became unpopular through whatever mixture of like propaganda and <laughs> undermining by uh, this country's corporations. I think that it's become like less of a topic of conversation. I know in the past couple of years, unions have become more popular like nationwide. Like it's depressing because union membership is like slowly growing, but it doesn't match the interest in unions. You know what I mean? It's like our business system and the way that corporations and everything in this country are now so fucked up from like a legal perspective that it is incredibly difficult to unionize. The Supreme yeah. Court just had a decision where they basically said 
that corporations can like sue unions and like hold them liable for the amount of profit that the corporation lost, would yeah. lose because the people are striking. So again, that's like a very pro business decision from a Supreme Court who has been set up to deliver pro business <sighs> Mm -hmm. decisions so like it's very infuriating but ultimately i think that it probably took a lot of i'll say gumption to basically end your show which does all this like superhero myth uh commentary and end it on your activist character basically breaking the fourth wall and telling audiences why cops are bad and why unions <laughs> are good. <laughs> I have to admire the audacity of that. Yeah. And I do admire it. Um, so yeah, it's like one of those things where I think it's a catch-22, like putting this show on Prime Video <sighs> feels off. But at the same time, you're making Prime Video deliver this message, which <laughs> feels... A little bit like a win yeah it's, so... it's just it's like you got the it's that's why i think this show is also super hip-hop especially the classic mm -hmm. version of hip-hop because we're at a state now hip-hop where i think younger artists see rap music much like they would see playing football or playing basketball as a way to get okay. out of the hood and get a mm -hmm. certain amount of wealth and and and, and escape you know, very much like the character is sorry to bother you, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I can mm -hmm. talk like these white folks. I could go up the ranks of this company and I can have a nice life to take care of me and my pretty girlfriend and do all the things I always mm -hmm. wanted to do. But the era in which Boots was a rapper was, oh, this label going about to give us half a million dollars to make this album? We about to put the most radical black power, you know, the mm -hmm. East Coast, they're talking about five percenter uh black muslim ideology and people coming together and cops are bad you can't trust sellouts and this like mm -hmm. you know and all this type of stuff in the west coast is bringing all the actual classic black panther ideology like you're getting this in the music which creates a certain idea of rap music unless you know like yeah you have jay-z and you have puff you have everybody talking about we gotta get but even that getting money was a radical nature because it's like, oh, they're not going to let us have money. So we know we're going to mm -hmm. get the most money and we're going to build our mm -hmm. own businesses and then we're going to do X, Y, and Z and we're going to help us all to get together, which then mutates into Jay-Z sitting in a room with Robert Goodell and the owners talk that, about... This is the classic... Like, yeah, it, this is yeah. the classic capitalist... Uh, question yeah. right so i i said this somewhere else and it was sort of flippant and this requires a little bit of a deviation but uh julian and i have been watching the idol and the yeah, idol... i'm the only person that likes it i'm the only person <laughs> julian's the only person who likes it in the world mm -hmm. um but in the we just watched the third episode and in the third episode um you know, Sam Levinson has this line in the post episode, like video explainer, where he says like Jocelyn, this pop star is going from one cult, the music industry to this other cult run by uh, the weekend's character named Tedris Tedris. And on the one hand, I'm like, sure. The music industry is a cult. You can say every entertainment industry is a cult. I don't actually think that's like an interesting idea. I think it's just like an obvious observation. Mm -hmm. But what it made me think like from a larger perspective is like capitalism is a cult. Like yeah. that's the thing. Like mm -hmm. the idea of like the relentless pursuit of individualistic wealth, that is the brainwashing that has like taken hold of this country, right? To greater and greater extremes. It is what drives venture capitalists it is what drives the media moguls who have destroyed journalism it is what drives the people right now who are not giving the striking writers what they want who make in a year multiple times more than all the writers want as a collective yeah. that is the cult ideology and so when we talk about like 
Jay-Z working with the NFL. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. That is capitalism as a cult ideology. It is thinking if I as a person can amass everything, then of course it would inspire other people to also amass everything. But like, that's not how it works. Um, and I really appreciated that this show does that right? It shows you the hero who is someone who is successful because capitalism has worked for them. And they clearly believe that it should work for everyone else. Mm -hmm. It should work for everybody. But what's so interesting, even about the show doing that, is it clearly doesn't because the hero still needs to fight crime, right? Like crime is still happening because people are still desperate because the system is still fucked up. And the fact that one person has managed to like break free of it and become successful does not mean that the system is set up for everybody else. So I think it's really smart to end with Jones showing him, right? The history of like all these different um, illicit businesses. businesses, And how they become legal and how it switches over. And mm-hmm. who, the owned, nature of like, who owned yeah. it then who owns it now um we even saw you know like boardwalk empire was not a show that was necessarily interested in this but boardwalk empire did have like a significant uh criminal element that was run by black people and there mm-hmm. was this sort of tension in the show and in that season of Fargo, that was also about Kansas City, right? Yeah. Which is about like, how is it that we can have like white run crime families who are able to get the cops on their side, pay off politicians, get all of these inroads into legitimacy. And then you also have like black run gangs who do not have that who don't same, have the same who don't have that same have sort the same of path. relationship right exactly so then when it becomes legal when things like drugs become legal when things like alcohol become legal again after prohibition who benefits which one of those criminal enterprises benefits um so i really like that the show has this sort of like backward gaze upon that um and is willing to bring it in and that means that the story moves away from Cootie a little bit, right? Like the does. ending does not necessarily answer the questions about this character. I'm wondering if that worked for you. Like if we don't get a season two, are you okay with where? And I don't think we will. My understanding was that this was a limited series. And mm-hmm. I know sometimes they say that and then they renew them for season two anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we weren't to get an ending, how would you feel? about where we end with Cootie. You know, I'm you know, I'm usually fine with ambiguous endings because unlike most people, uh life doesn't answer all your questions. Mm-hmm. Anybody's questions, sometimes things just happen, you know, um mm-hmm. I'm a big proponent of the way the Sopranos ended when, originally when it came on, I fought that I fought those fights. It's like I didn't see Tony Soprano get born, so I don't expect to see what happened to him the end either like i'm good Mm -hmm. but um the show does an interesting thing and and to also there's a thing in superhero comics where it's like the never-ending battle right Mm -hmm. and that's what was ringing out to me when i was getting to the end because this the the key component of taking on the corporation is basically tied upon a healthcare issue and Mm -hmm. something that we all Mm -hmm. have to, to deal with some of us less than others like i'm lucky enough to have fire healthcare you know, because of my employment. Um, Shout out to the idea that health insurance and healthcare should not be tied to your employment. That is one of the most dehumanizing, undignified ideas. And it's just an incredibly American idea that your worth is only tied to the labor you produce. And it's incredibly fucked up. But yes. But seeing that it explained very well, which I think is a very key moment of the show because it happens at a time where Cootie is is learning other things about life mm-hmm. while like something happens to one of his friends and mm-hmm. this is a divide between like 
one of his friends because uh what uh I forget his name yeah, we, can give like, so we can give like yeah. more context so like so cootie makes a uh he becomes friends with three people who are already friends yeah there is this guy felix yes who, felix uh works at like a car store and uh is very into like restoring his car he's sort of in this like underground like car culture community um his friend scat who is obsessed with this comic book series, the show within a show called Parking Tickets, which we can talk about a yeah. little bit because there's it's animated. Yeah. There's a lot with parking tickets. And then there's the third friend, Jones, who we have discussed previously as like the activist and organizer who has the superpower of, we'll just call it persuasion. Mm. Um, and who at the end shows the hero, like the error of his ways and the fallacy of his thinking um but yeah so what happens is scat uh gets in an accident on his bicycle mm -hmm. he gets impaled with like a piece of metal he goes to a private hospital that rejects to care for him because they don't take uninsured yep. clients happens every single minute of every single day in america um and so then he waits for the bus the bus is unreliable also happens every All second of every day in america um and eventually felix picks him up takes him to the public hospital where he could get treatment uh and he passes away so that story becomes another big motivator in this like description of uh organized labor and striking Action, because yeah. Yeah, because the workers at that first hospital are shocked by the administration turning away this young man who was in a life or death situation and needed help. Um, so yeah, so you're saying that Cootie becomes more aware of like these larger, maybe larger in that they're more, more widespread, but also more direct because healthcare is such a like personal direct type yeah. of thing. So, so Cootie is becoming more aware of all of this. Yeah. It's, I think it's that it's also it would start ties to his parents and to the mm -hmm. narrative more in terms of that's where you start getting the conflict with his mother and Jones and sort of the ideology on what, what you should do versus what, what they feel was done in the past and if you mm -hmm. understand certain things about the past certain actions that was in my certain groups were responded in kind which led to their downfall and destruction which is why jones is like we need to do things in other ways but this is also happening at the same time where like cootie gets to explore like life and love and attention Sex. and all types of things and like mm -hmm. felix is just like Bro, I don't care about none of this. The homie did. Mm -hmm. Like, like mm -hmm. I, he doesn't even really care about activism. Just like mm -mm. the homie's dead, and to have that character in there that's like not only Felix, but also like the gang leader who starts out as like an attack, a yes. quick antagonist for Cootie to become like an actual, you know, representing the street or the gang culture of a city getting involved with these these things which people mm -hmm. don't understand happens um mm -hmm. it's very interesting to show that there's multiple viewpoints within the dialogue of the black community and the situation that we're in in america and then also how that all ties along to everything else on a larger scale of capitalism and class mm -hmm. and resources and how things spent we, you know, we to even go back with the hero. In the end, the hero just learned he's a tool. He doesn't even. He thinks that he's this leader and paragon of 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 virtue, and basically he finds out he's just being used by the system he believes in, and it shakes. Him and to that's what bothers him more, almost yeah. than like the racism and like the classism is the idea that like he was not who he thought he was. Right. Yeah. Like he thought that he was empowered and elevated. And ultimately, you're only deriving your power because they have let you mm -hmm. have that power. Um, 
so yes, yeah, so I think that's a really interesting point. Um, the gang leader's name is Bear, and he's played by the actor Craig Tate. I he thought was, he, was he was like great. he was funny. He, he was, was great. great. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there is like a weak link in the cast overall. No. Probably the only thing I would say is, I wish there was a little bit more. I think that the episode about Flora showing like her flash yeah. powers and all that sort of stuff. I thought that was good. I thought there could have been a little bit more in terms of her relationship with Cootie. Yeah. So I think it sort of goes very quickly from like, we're dating to we're in love to I'll follow you into this terrorist act. I'll follow you into the, <laughs> into the, into the, into the yeah, to the brink of the end. And it's all, it also is like, she'll follow, but she's also like, she's clearly more mature and advanced. Mm-hmm. Than he is, but mm-hmm. he's also mm-hmm. bearing this uh, the weight of what his his parents expect of him, which is mm-hmm. like, yeah, we kept you from this, as you said, they kept him from this world, not only because they worry about what the world would think of him, but to the, to to them, he is the possible leader of of salvation and freedom, and right. a very like the father is hard love, like don't lean on the wall. I'm tired of mm-hmm. tired of fixing this wall all the time, and it's just mm-hmm. like, no, you can't eat that. My mess. guts, you perfect, can't, yeah, perfect. You can't, my you guts, none of that mess. You can't put that in your body. The whole mm-hmm. like, oh y'all didn't be having cheeseburgers and all type of stuff. And man, when I related to that, I'm like, man, sometimes the way the parents be do as I say, not as I do, and then you find mm-hmm. out like what, like. Y'all and you take 100. it so personally. You yeah. take it so personally because then it becomes this feeling of like you're almost not considering that they want like better for you or different for you. It's like you as the child, it's like, well, you're supposed to like, you're supposed to be honest with me, right? Like yeah. you're supposed to be authentic. You're supposed to be sincere. Um, so even having those little moments where like he doesn't quite understand what his parents want from him but he feels the weight of it and the yeah. responsibility of it. Um, I think that we should probably, we don't have to talk about this in depth, but like the production design of this show, my understanding is that it was mostly practical. Um, I don't you know how like they a, did that. Like a lot of like uh, using lenses perspective mm-hmm. to show that like Jarell's mm-hmm. was really big or they make like giant puppets and giant yeah. like body yeah. parts to show like to really yeah. shoot it in scale. And I was like, to yeah, make, make it feel like it because even when they show people do certain things, there's, there's moments where people jump really high. And it's just like it's mm-hmm. like, oh, mm-hmm. like it's like mm-hmm. first of all, mm-hmm. how are you jumping on the street, thirteen hundred foot man like this? <laughs> but that's fun, right? Yeah. And I think that keeps the show. Like we're talking about a lot of like heavy subject matter, but it's like the production of the design, the production design of the show is very playful and colorful. Um, and like you said, sort of shifting with perspective. Um, I think Jarell Jerome's performance is so well done because he has to balance between this person who's like new to the world, right? Mm-hmm. Who in a lot of ways is like very childish and very immature, um, but also doesn't have a filter. So like he feels everything to the extreme. Yeah. And I think making that sort of character uh sympathetic without being pathetic like you don't necessarily pity cootie you can like empathize with like what's being asked of him uh without finding him like childish necessarily i think is very solid but i really want to know what you think about parking tickets and like what is the purpose of the show within the show how did you feel about like the animation style like all like because i'm so curious about the show within a show and we have to say that in sorry to bother you there was also a show within a movie which was like a reality show where people go on this show and they suffer like horrible indignities for money right Mm -hmm. like isn't, I don't remember exactly what it was called, but it was it was something about like I got this shit slapped out of me or something, mm-hmm. something like <laughs> so, that. Yeah, and it was also that so reality like, show with the Fox, basically American Foxconn workers, who people mm-hmm. who live at their job like show their like their their little like warehouse apartments where they their dorms, like, their factory dorms. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I was so like, the, so there was like, yeah, so there was like the propaganda show within the show. 
and the commentary on reality tv show within the show and yeah. here we get this animated show called parking tickets which scat is obsessed with i sort of viewed it maybe as like a simpsons analog no um, i i to me it was yes adult. please yeah to me okay so parking tickets um, it reminded me of Mr. Pickles. I don't know if you ever watched. Mr. Oh yeah, Pickles it looks on like Swim. any adult. It looks like Mr. Pickles. Yeah. To what I call, and people could take this anyway, the ugly aesthetic anime animated yes. adult series. Adam Adam was a big Mr. Pickles fan, and I was like, Adam, what is that? Like, I showed him parking tickets. He was like, Oh, it's Mr. Pickles. It's like yeah. the people are purposefully ugly. Like they mm -hmm. look brutish, like repellent. Yeah. But there's also like a beauty and a gracefulness to the animation although everybody and think, everything is ugly i think the writing was being set it's very interesting because it's like when you're watching the show within the show you have this feeling that only cootie is understanding the existential writing of the show because he's he was been forced to read books 10 hours a mm -hmm. day for like his whole life. So like while Scat and others just kind of laugh at the the Bart Simpson as character that just says the the little funny dialogue boy, line. Boy, 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 boy. And it's it, it's and it's like over and everybody laughs and forgets about it. It's the stuff being said in between and around it is just like, oh, this is where you're putting like the like Jones explains things, but this is where you're actually explaining the show is mm -hmm. in the cartoon mm -hmm. with these with this dense like the whole the winter one where we're just basically like basically talking about life in America as it is. I was like, I was like, oh okay, like I get this because there's times where like Adventure Time is a very silly looking show, right? Mm -hmm. And people kind of play it off Adventure Time. It's like, oh it's Finn and Jake the dog and Baking pancakes, making baking pancakes, like it's silly, it's cute, right? But then when you really watch Vision Time, it's like, and you see what the writers are like actually writing about, and you really listen and understand how they're talking about like this was the fall of society, this is what it is to be human, this is how it is to be like, this is about love and all these type of things. And you're sitting in there, I'm watching this, like, all right, is everybody getting it? Or they just like the fact that like Finn just is like, I'm a big baby that can dance so I can can't like I like I get it like it's cute like I love that part too where it's just like oh okay and I, I see that cartoon as almost even a talk of what they're trying to do with the show like mm -hmm. this is a show about a giant black kid essentially he fights a superhero and tries to basically save Oakland from evil capitalists but in the midst of all that, we're going to talk about all these other ideas about organized labor, the idea of a general strike, something that no one's actually mm -hmm. talking about. Like, mm -hmm. maybe we all should strike together. Mm -hmm. Not just the WGA here, some random Starbucks people here, some random mm -hmm. Amazon people who get beat. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. if, some teachers somewhere. Nah, like, what mm -hmm. if everybody just stopped working? What y'all going to do? Like, mm -hmm. um... I think also what parking tickets probably does, and this I think is your idea, I'm just saying it in a different way, yeah. is I think it makes the argument that like the the form of something does not necessarily dictate what it's about. Yeah. You can tell a superhero story that isn't just about like a made up apocalypse. You can have an animated show that isn't just about like quote children's themes which mm -hmm. is something that animation runs into all the time, right? Like there is this long standing animation is for kids. Yeah, for Ameri which it yeah is. in America, sure. in America. It, in America, it sure, is. there is animation for kids. There is also animation for adults. It does not mean just because something is drawn does not mean it's for a specific age group. Um, so I think there's some of that too. And yeah, the parking tickets, there is like this portion of an episode that Scat watches before his death, which is like the black weatherman reading the weather report. And we're seeing like the town where this weather event is going to happen. And you're seeing like the very rich and the unhoused. You're seeing like 
a married couple with a child and you're seeing like a single person you're yeah. seeing a high 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 rise and you're seeing a cemetery and there's this like lengthy sort of melancholy beautiful speech about how weather is like the great equalizer in a certain way and death is the great mm-hmm. equalizer in a certain way like you cannot uh outrun the end of your life certainly incredibly rich people are trying to but yeah. ultimately it's like when you leave this world what do you leave behind um and then in that same episode is where scat dies and his death inspires the different like strike movements yeah. cooties sort of like coming of age where he realizes what's really going on in oakland uh eventually then the hero's realization of being used as a tool so yeah i mean there's a there's a lot there's, there's a, a lot, lot going on in this show, show. and to be only yeah. seven episodes to only be essentially half an hour episodes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to be that dense and i was mm-hmm. like I was like, and wow. to include lines to include lines that are like as throwaway, but I think as telling and funny as uh, the hero has this assistant who is played by the guy from Insecure. Oh my God, why can't I remember his name? Kendrick Sampson. Um, and this guy is like interviewing this woman to see if she would be like a good romantic partner for the hero. And he's describing how she's like a teacher. She's an artist. She's a dancer. She did a little bit of consulting work for Obama and for the Saudis. And I, I died. I was like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> a it show that is willing, a show that is willing to discuss Obama and the Saudis hand in hand. <laughs> uh, just made me laugh a lot. So it was, yeah. That whole setup of the the way the hero lives and the mm-hmm. the even joke of his AI's voice turning into Bill Cosby because Bill of Cosby the of the like pull your pants up out of it and it's like his computer system even he was confused it's like why is my AI sounding like Bill Bill Cosby and it's just like I was like America because it's like that's America's dad the voice the voice that gets him up in the morning is and I was like. His Yo, mom it's... being Morgan Fairchild. Oh my goodness, it was so it was mm-hmm. it was so so the whole like why are you even doing this? The whole idea of that he's rich and even other rich people are like, why are you even trying to do good? What is this? Right. right. There's no police in the show because all the policing Correct. in their neighborhood you hear police is done by the hero every yeah. so often, but yeah. It's by the hero. The hero is the person right. that is the only person that interacts within their world. He's the representative of the state. Yes. Like in every way that he needs to be, he is the representative of the state. Yeah. Something that was just a little detail that I really liked um is that his building like moves around him. Him? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. It's like Sorry to Bother You, which had the golden elevator, which was such a symbol of going Mm -hmm. from one class to another. And this, uh, the hero is powerful enough that people literally come to him. Like he stands in the middle of his building and the building goes up and down depending on who he wants to see. So just another one of those like very, um, just very visually interesting way to take a turn of phrase and make it something compelling and cinematic on screen. Visually, um, yeah. Visually telling like that it, story. Um, yeah. I also like there was the part when people are painting murals of of Scat and Felix mm-hmm. loses it. Like, he hates you it. didn't yeah. know him. This just mm-hmm. happened. What are you mm-hmm. doing? And I was like... And he gets mad at Jones as well. Yeah. He says to Jones, you're using Scat's death for your own cause. Yeah. And yeah. it, it's, yeah. it's very rare to that's what I think it's very rare to see that viewpoint mm-hmm. uh, shown especially within fiction because mm-hmm. there's a point where it's just like when a black person is killed by the police state violence right mm-hmm. there are people who's like I don't want to see that anymore 
Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to talk about that anymore. We know it happened. It's been happening. I don't want to see that. Like, mm-hmm. there's a certain point where I used to do portraits of people slain by state violence, right? Right. And it got to yeah. the point where it was just like, what is this for? And is this helping? Right. Or what is this doing? Like, you mm-hmm. know, I, I wasn't one of the people that's trying to do it and try to get a bunch of likes and them. Like, I wouldn't barely even promote it. But then mm-hmm. you also go on Instagram or these other things that you would see it and just like, all right, like, what is... I think some of those George Floyd pieces came out within hours of his death, right? Right. You see right. it is just like, this ain't, this, it's like, this ain't, this ain't really the way. Like, I get what you guys want to say, what you want to do, and you're trying to do this, you're trying to march, but I don't know if this is it. And one of my favorite parts of the show is to have, you have that dialogue because as much as I think in the end, Jones is is put up as probably like the most altruistic and heroic, it's not without question. Like, there's mm-hmm. still, like, if they, let's say if, they, if there's still more to come, there's, there's still the issues with Felix, and there's still the issues with um with Cootie's parents because there's a certain thing mm-hmm. where it's like, yes, a uh, radical radical violence against the state may not have worked this time, but you can't say in America radical viol- of re- rebellious violence doesn't always work because of the myth of this country is you do a bunch of tea in the sea. And you yeah. do X, Y, and Z, and it's almost you have to work both within concert, which I think is probably the only thing that the show didn't get around getting to was that mm-hmm. con- that 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 conversation is like is that a conversation people want to have? Like that gets mm-hmm. into deeper knowledge. Is like yo, what is freedom and what y'all talking about? Because that can lead to a lot of a lot of spilled blood, and in the end, it's like. I would be it would be interesting to see if they get to that conversation to get another set of episodes if they want to do another set of episodes because in the end it's just like the show can end as it is just like sorry to, sorry to bother you um mm-hmm. just like uh sorry to bother you just it ended in a way it's like oh they could be bored of this but we're not mm-hmm. gonna get any more and we're fine with it we're fine with it mm-hmm. um, Well, and I think the thing, like, to your point about the radical violence thing is that, like, I think that there is a valid point. So basically what happens is, like, there is a, uh, the electrical company that services Oakland does, like, random blackouts to save money. It doesn't matter that this is inconvenient or hurtful. They do it, and it is what it is. Um, and Cootie, basically, with the support of his parents, especially his mom, right, um, decides that they are going to, like, attack the electrical station and cause, like, a longer blackout that will eventually be, uh, like, damaging to the company, right? There, it's like yeah. something, there's, yeah. Um, and so they do it. They're successful. The power goes out for, like, a minute. <laughs> And then it comes back on. And what they learn is like, of course, the electrical company was like prepared for this. They had a backup generator. They're just going to keep doing what they're doing. And so there was no real uh, effect to what Cootie did. And so on one level, it sort of reminded me of the Matrix sequels. With this sense of like, there's always going to be a Neo who was trying to undermine the system, but the system is too big to fail. Mm -hmm. So that sort of, I liked that idea. But on the other hand, I think that those sorts of actions do have a political purpose and generate attention and can inspire people who were not uh, cognizant before of like what direct action can do yeah it's sort of like um the film how to blow up a pipeline which came out earlier this year it sort of ends with this idea i guess spoiler alert it ends with this idea that like actions of violence can inspire others actions of violence and sometimes that is exactly what you need so yeah that is one idea where i sort of felt 
a little bit surprised by mm -hmm. the show taking that perspective. Um, so it's like, you know, I don't want to be like, Boots Riley, what do you think about terrorism? Um, but I think it is sort of like, a, do you not think that there's any space for this kind of decision making? Um, yeah. Why would you make it so, so sort of black and white as a final choice? Um, that's like maybe the only place where I felt one of a few places where I felt like a little bit like the storytelling was rushed. But I agree with you, like it ends in this place that is ambiguous in a way that I think is good. It could continue on, but I think it makes its points without needing to, right? Like it's mm -hmm. not like it ends with a cliffhanger where we're wondering what happens next. I think it basically says what it wants to say about how people need to work together across industries. Um, and it does so in a way that also makes sure to reject the idea of lawfulness as the only example of moral goodness. Yeah. Laws are made by people. It's like... Correct. Correct. And people are flawed. Yeah. People are not objective. Um, people are subjective. And laws are subjective, as we very it's well know. All the time, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so I, you know, I think it's one of those things where I'm not, it It all drops on Prime same day. I'm not sure that's like the best decision. <laughs> uh, I don't really understand the uh, binge versus weekly model over there. But Julian, how did you watch it? Did you binge it or would you recommend people like do it in chunks? I think I watched it in chunks because just the nature of time of, Going mm -hmm. to see movies in, mm -hmm. the, in in the evening and having to fit things in, mm -hmm. um, but you get it's only seven episodes, so it didn't take a lot of time to get through it. Yeah, and they're, they're short episodes as well, so um, I think it's something you could binge. But I do mm -hmm. think it's a show that does probably work with multiple viewings because I think there's more you can get mm -hmm. out of it, even for a person like me that kind of gets everything the first time because I'm pretty mm -hmm. like. I pay I pay attention, you know. I'll read the like the little press notes or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. I'm I'll I'll rewind. So I think the I think I don't know if I had a uh, captions on. I don't know because you know when we get screeners, we don't always get the subtitles. And I'm like, mm -hmm. God dang it! That's the only thing I I know. I, it's, it's, it's like the most needed thing in in 2023. Watching is like I need my I need my closed captioning. Um, All of the audio mixes are bad. Everywhere. Need the close yeah, everywhere. Um, <laughs> they're clearly they're clearly mixing for people watching things on their phone with like AirPods in their head, in their ears and right. not like yeah. speakers on televisions. Mm -hmm. um, or computers. Or computers with give yeah, speakers. Like yes. it's just you're not mixing for that. But yeah. uh what about you? How did you watch it? Did you split it up or did you watch all the one? I I split it up, I think. I think I watched like the first three and then the next four or maybe like the first four and then the next three something like that yeah. and I think that was good um like you said it's one of those things where it's like I think that there's so much happening within the frame that like you you should be paying attention because you're gonna have is, to because you will miss it's the kind of yeah it's the kind of like cinematography and editing that is engaging and immersive so like why not maybe the only scene that I was confused about was like the sex scene um i think i kind of i think it's supposed to be confusing yeah i think that's because we don't know how that works yes we don't know how that works but otherwise like there's so much happening that i think you know i, I think you probably would be served by splitting it up just mm -hmm. to be able to like absorb and ingest some of what's happening if you wanted to watch sorry to bother you before or after that probably wouldn't be a bad idea mm -hmm. um but yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think at a time like when we're very used to <laughs> certain types of stories on TV, I think this is like a very uh, divergent narrative and a very singular 
like a visual experience yeah so i don't know i don't know how much i don't know how much more we could recommend it right? yeah yeah i think it's it's a clear recommendation it's clearly mm-hmm. one of the best shows of the summer so far um mm-hmm. and you know people shouldn't if you got this far you've been spoiled so i'm not going to say you shouldn't have watched this no you know like you shouldn't you should have got you got this far we said spoilers like what eight times Yes. But. And, you know, I'm very strongly against the idea that, like, knowing a spoiler ruins your enjoyment of a thing. Right? Oh, like, yeah. we're all adults. You know? Just Are we? watch the show. Are Americans adults anymore? <laughs> really? That's where you should end the episode. <laughs> this podcast, leaving you with the question. <laughs> Are Americans even adults anymore? Tune in next time for Julian's <laughs> lengthy thesis. <laughs> All right. uh, thanks rocky okay. for talking to me about this maybe yes, maybe we can do one about the idol in which i say why i like it i mean it, if you want to like raise my blood pressure sure yeah we can do that and we got like what two <laughs> two more episodes to go two weeks. three more two yeah. more weeks yeah. yes five episodes another show that i thought was a limited series but now it might not be i don't know no it's there i said it's not getting another season so the but idol then hbo was... said that the a decision was not made oh they would they retract it what they say okay, yeah okay yeah, right. yeah 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 okay oh, like gosh. i don't know all if right. you can make a you can split a weekend album in two but <laughs> all this is <laughs> all this is <laughs> I don't know. But you know what's funny? And we we can like, you know, we don't have to go further about this idea. But it is interesting to me that both of these shows, again, are grappling with the idea of like, whether creativity can be sincere and also commercial. Mm-hmm. But I think that what I'm a Virgo has to say is more interesting to me than what the idol has to say. But you know, this might be like a part two. We might do a part two yeah, with the we'll idol. See. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pro idol people. Let this be known. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.